Lightning is one of nature's most awesome forces. This week on Adventure Bound, I'll review the damage done by a lightning strike in my house. The second segment on this episode is from a kayaking outing through Ellison Park on Arondecoy Creek. The next stop will be in the southern tier of New York State to view the water cascades and erosion sculpted stone formations in Watkins Glen. Back home, I turned my camera on the playful antics of my cat Samantha. The final segment is from eastern Massachusetts where I was a passenger in a jeep on a trail ride at a four wheel drive off road festival. Stay tuned for Adventure Bound. Welcome to Adventure Bound. Hello, I'm Tim Bear. I will often see unusual or interesting things when I am out on an adventure. Sometimes I don't have to travel at all to see something unordinary. One such occasion was in the spring of 1998 when lightning struck my house. The following video is about the damage done by a lightning bolt to my truck, my driveway, and my lawn. A lightning strike is a violent and powerful event. A standard electric outlet in a house provides 110 volts of electricity and 15 amperes of current. By contrast, a lightning strike delivers about 300,000 volts and currents ranging up to 200,000 amperes. Lightning heats the air around it to as much as 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The rapid expansion of the heated air produces the sound waves of thunder. One spring morning, I was able to view the effects of a lightning strike at my house. There was a hole in the ground beside the garage. Next to the rear tire of my Explorer was a hole where the pavement had been blasted away. The hole in the pavement was two inches deep, 10 inches wide, and more than two feet in length. Later, I would search for and find the missing pavement pieces. The front wheel also had a two inch deep lightning induced hole and the front tire was flat. After moving the truck, I noticed that the rubber on the tire had been vaporized and the tread pattern was burned into the pavement. The lightning had burned six holes in the tire. Not repairable, the tire had to be replaced. There was a line, rather a small ditch, going from the tire past the post for the basketball hoop to the base of the maple tree. The lightning strike interacted with water in the soil. The tremendous heat from the strike instantly transformed the water into steam. The rapidly expanding explosion of steam is what caused the damage to the pavement and the lawn. Lightning is one of nature's most violent forces. The current of a lightning strike actually travels from the ground up to the cloud. As the thunderstorm grows, the electrical charges build up within the cloud. Oppositely charged particles gather at the ground below. Negatively charged electrons build up in the cloud and begin zigzagging toward the ground. This is called the stepper leader. Since the atmosphere is a good insulator, 
the weak charge of the stepper leader snakes its way downward, often branching, trying to find the path of least resistance toward the oppositely charged particles on the ground. As the stepper leader nears the ground, it draws a streamer of positive charge up from the ground. Positive ions gather on the ground and then flow in streams toward the leader. As the leader and the streamer come together, a powerful electric current begins flowing. An intense wave of positive charge, or return stroke, travels up 60,000 miles per second. The bright white channel of the lightning flash only lasts a few milliseconds, followed immediately by thunder. The entire top of the vehicle is covered with mud, sticks, tree bark, and driveway pieces. Each year, about 100 people are killed and about 245 injured in the United States by nature's number one weather-related killer. Lightning-related injuries in the U.S. occur most often in Florida, where thunderstorms are very common. I located the missing pieces of pavement distributed around my neighbor's yard. Some of the pieces were more than 30 feet from the position that they formerly occupied in my driveway. I returned to inspect my garage and the garage doorway. The explosion of topsoil next to my garage had splattered mud on the garage door. The mud hit and stuck under the top of the garage door opening, as well as under the eave of the roof. I later found a piece of side small piece of driveway. Kayaks are very maneuverable and stable watercraft. They are well suited for a range of uses, from darting through heavy whitewater rapids to smooth skimming on the surface of calm streams and bays. My friend has two kayaks and invited me to join him for a day on the water. One Saturday morning, Adam Muzilak and I loaded up my Explorer for a day of kayaking. This outing was going to be a new experience for me, as I had never before been a kayak. We put the kayaks in Arondequoit Creek, inside Ellison Park. On its route through Ellison Park, Arondequoit Creek is slow moving and shallow. The two main tributaries of Arondequoit Creek are Thomas and Allen Creeks. From our starting point, just south of the Daisy Flour Mill, we would paddle upstream a little ways before turning around and heading towards Arondequoit Bay. Like a burrito with a touch of feed, uh, little up today. On parts of the creek, there were trees that produced a canopy, and the creek ran through a tunnel made of bark, branches, and leaves. Though a new experience for me, Adam was proficient at handling a kayak and moved through the water with relative ease. One of the features we passed was the abutment for an old bridge. Arondequoit Creek passes under several footbridges in Ellison Park and then under automobile bridges at Blossom Road and Atlantic Avenue. In the 17th century, Arondequoit Creek was more of a river and as much as a quarter mile wide when the first French explorers arrived in the early 1600s. The famous French explorer La Salle is said to have traveled into Arondequoit Bay and Arondequoit Creek during a search for an all-water route to the Pacific Ocean in 1669. Up to the mid-18th century, the Seneca Indians dominated the area. The Indians traded with the new foreigners using a well-worn trail leading from Arondequoit Creek at Indian Landing to the Genesee River. Boats and supplies were carried along this trail to avoid the falls on the Genesee. It was part of one of the most important overland routes from the east to the Ohio Valley. 
For well over a century, the area was the scene of conflicts involving the Indians, the French, the English, and colonists. The Treaty of Paris in 1783, which ended the War for Independence, also helped initiate the organized growth of the area. The land, once claimed by the Massachusetts colony, officially became part of the state of New York and was opened up for trade and settlement. At Indian Landing, near the present-day corner of Landing Road and Blossom Road, 30-ton schooners docked to transport the produce of the frontier. We stopped on the water of Arondicoit Bay for lunch. Lunchtime. Lunchtime. Ciao. Ciao. Mm, good. Ciao. Good. Good stuff. Adam and I returned to Arondicoit Creek a week or so later. This time we started farther upstream. There had been rain a day before, and the water in the creek was running more swiftly than on our previous trip. That was some sweet rapids, Sometimes, trees will fall completely into the creek, blocking or partially obstructing the waterway. Other times, trees will hang across the creek, creating a curtain of leaves and branches. Watkins Glen State Park in New York State is perhaps the best known of the Finger Lake State Parks. The main draw is the gorge, an erosion sculpted rock chasm with 19 waterfalls. When hiking up the gorge path, one of the first views is Sentry Bridge. The beginning of the gorge trail passes through the entrance tunnel. No machines were used in the construction of the tunnels in the gorge. The rock from the tunnels was cut and removed by hand in the early 1900s. The word glen comes from an old Gaelic word. It means a small, narrow, secluded alley. Some of the rock cliffs on the wall of the glen rise 200 feet above the floor. The gorge trail is a mile and a half long. If you walk the gorge trail from the beginning to the end, you will hike and climb through an elevation change of 600 feet. The gorge path winds over and under waterfalls. This section of the gorge path goes behind the water of the cavern cascade. Watkins Glen State Park is in the village of Watkins Glen. Initially, the gorge was privately owned and operated as a tourist attraction. The state of New York established a state park in 1906. This bridge spans Central Cascade. Central Cascade is the highest waterfall in the gorge. The water drops more than 60 feet to the plunge pool.
On the right side of this view is Rainbow Falls. The gorge path goes behind the falls. In the late afternoon on a sunny day, a rainbow is produced by sunlight reflecting off the spray. The layers of rock in the gorge were formed from sediment which accumulated when the Watkins Glen area was at the bottom of a sea some 370 million years ago. Over time, the great weight of the many layers eventually turned the sediment into stone. Sand became sandstone, silt became siltstone, and clay became weak crumbly shale. In addition to the gorge path, there are also rim trails that overlook the gorge. I presently have two cats, Maxton and Samantha. Maxton is a Manx, which is a breed that does not have a tail. Samantha is a much more common gray tiger. The following video features both of my cats, but it is mostly about Samantha in the first few months after I adopted her. I already had an 11-year-old cat named Maxton when I adopted a kitten in the summer of 1998. I named her Samantha. Samantha was not bashful in her pursuit of yogurt. Animals learn from experience. For some animals, it just takes more experience. Here is Samantha, a couple of weeks later, a bigger kitty, same size brain. I discovered that Samantha liked the texture and noise of a plastic grocery bag. I rolled up the grocery bag into a ball and created the perfect toy for Samantha. Like a puppy, she would chase down the ball and retrieve it. That's a good little doggy. I became quite fond of Samantha over the passing weeks. I couldn't help but notice that at times, her ability to learn seemed to be only slightly higher than that of sedimentary rock. I nicknamed her Stonehead. This is the Chinese depiction of opposites in life's harmony, yin and yang. In my house, I have the feline version of harmony, Max and Sam.
Playing fetch is Samantha's favorite pastime. When I am working at my computer, she will march into my office with a ball for me to throw. Sam will hang around my feet until I throw the ball for her. Maxton soon realizes that he picked a bad spot to sit for grooming. Unlike the Stonehead, Max has the ability to quickly learn from his experience and decide to relocate before the return of the Kamikaze Kitty. Today's first lesson for the Stonehead, the small, narrow beam of a flashlight is very difficult to catch. Today's second lesson, a cat in motion will stay in motion until it gets dizzy. Then it will lay still and hold onto the floor until it is convinced that the room has stopped moving. At times, Samantha is a pent-up package of energy on a hair trigger. After a long day, it is nice to have a buddy to help clean those hard to get to places on top of your head. My friend Steve Smiley has a Jeep YJ Wrangler that he modified to be able to handle extreme terrain. I stopped by Eastern Massachusetts one time to ride along with him on a trail during a four-wheel drive festival. The three-day festival consisted of a series of trail rides. Starting times were assigned for each trail and vehicles would line up and head out as a group. To maximize traction on rocky terrain, the tire air pressure is lowered. From the usual road tire pressure of 30 psi, the air pressure is lowered to 13 psi. The proper way to navigate obstacles is to proceed slowly, creeping along one rock at a time. This is called rock crawling. These vehicles have been modified for rock crawling. The suspension has been raised and oversized tires are added. The low range gear ratio has also been changed. The ratio for a stock vehicle is about 30 to 1. Some of the ratios used for rock crawling are as low as 92 to 1. When driving in such extreme terrain, breakdowns are inevitable. Unless you are willing to walk home, bringing spare parts and tools is a requirement. Included in their repair tools, this group had an air compressor and an impact wrench. The front hub was shattered on this vehicle and was replaced on the trail using a hub that had been included in the spare parts inventory.
Rather than avoid the large rocks, the drivers attempt to put their tires on the tallest rocks on the trail. Running the tires over the tallest rock will keep the vehicle undercarriage clear from other obstacles on the trail. Though definitely a male-dominated hobby, one of the most skilled people I saw on the trail was the driver of this Jeep Scrambler, a woman named Dee. Occasionally, the slow, methodical rock-crawling approach is abandoned in favor of brute force. 